Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle D'Amico, and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Public Programs at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs, or CGA. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Um, and I'd like to also provide a quick introduction to who we are for those of you who may be new to our community. Since its founding, our goal at CGA has been to prepare global citizens to make a positive impact in the world. We do this through a variety of activities, including our two graduate programs, one in global affairs, and our recently launched MS in global security, conflict, and cybercrime. We also offer a variety of professional and personal enrichment courses in the areas of global affairs and fundraising, and this includes several professional certificates. And of course, we host free public events such as this that expand upon the critical issues and timely topics that we cover in our classroom. Today we ask, how do we navigate in an unknown future filled with risks and opportunities? As an approach to this very big question, we will use the recent US withdrawal from Afghanistan as a case study to explore how risk management and scenarios frameworks can be leveraged to develop, develop treatment options and help organizations and individuals be better prepared for various eventualities. The discussion will be led by faculty from our recently launched professional certificate in risk management and scenarios planning. The program development was a collaboration between CJ clinical professors, Dr. Christopher Ankerson and Michael Oppenheimer, who worked closely with the program faculty who you will hear from today. Ashwara Gupta and Dr. Marcus Yeager will delve into these concepts, methodologies, and frameworks using Afghanistan as a case study. We've also reserved some time at the end of today's event for Q&A from the audience, so please feel free to submit them via the Q&A tool. And now, without further ado, I'm going to kick this over to Dr. Marcus Yeager, who teaches the Managing Risk and Uncertainty course within the new certificate program. I, I thought I'll, I'll approach this from a perspective point of view and ask, what does the future hold? Or not so much what does the future hold, but how can we manage risk and uncertainty on a forward-looking basis now that the U.S. has um, left Afghanistan? So... A traditional way of approaching this, whether it's financial markets, banking, or security questions, is first of all, you identify the risks, you analyze them, you try to get your hands around them, get a sense of like what these what do these risks imply from a probability perspective, if possible, but certainly from an impact perspective. Then you try as best as you can to, to rank those risks because you might have the opportunity to treat those risks, to mitigate those risks to lay off those risks. And then if this is a longer term cycle, what you want to do is, is monitor those risks and review your risk management framework over time to make sure that it's still adequate in terms of capturing the, the risks that you really want to capture and the ones you care about. And perhaps to add new risks to the, to the entire framework because there might be new emerging risks which you might want to be aware of and which you might want to, to manage. This is of course very conceptual, but as Chris was saying in the introduction, it's a very useful way to, to comp not compartmentalize, but to break down risk and uncertainty and get a better sense of what's going on. To say that something's uncertain is not particularly useful from a, a management perspective and a policy perspective. So what this allows you with all bells and whistles attached is to break down the problem and perhaps put in a position to deal with some of the risks and uncertainties more, um, more efficiently. So this is not meant to be a final word on what's going to happen in Afghanistan, just give you a sense of like the, the, the steps you'd have to go through. So number one is, what are the risks? So what I'm assuming here is that from a US foreign policy perspective, Afghanistan, the pullout and the rise of the, the takeover of, by the Taliban creates a risk for US interests. Um, so question number one is, what are the risks? This is not a trivial exercise. Sometimes you know what the risks are, sometimes you don't know what the risks are. So in this particular case, if you read the newspapers, you often see Afghanistan is mentioned in terms of terrorism risk. Of course, that was the reason why the US went in there in the first place 20 years ago. Another potential risk is region stability. Local power, neighboring powers might move into Afghanistan. It might lead to increased instability, say between India and Pakistan or China moves in. The third risk could be the expansion of Chinese influence in the context of global US-Chinese competition. And the interesting thing about identifying risks is sometimes you don't know what the risks are until they materialize. 
Uh, former Defense Secretary Rumsfeld used to refer to this unknown unknown. So there are things we know, there are certain things we know that we don't know them, but sometimes there are, there are things that we have no idea what they are. So I don't know, of course, we don't know at this stage what they are, but this is an important part of the risk identification process to, to, to ask yourself big questions and say, what, what are we missing here? What are potential risks to our interests, to the assets that we want to protect and really open up that question. Don't just go with, with uh, bureaucratic rules. And of course, a key aspect of risk is that there's just several aspects to it. One is, is the actual outcome and the impact it has on your interests. And number two is the likelihood of this occurring. Now, in the financial markets, often it's much easier, supposedly much easier to, to capture the risk and the probabilities. And you might even know about the outcomes, even though I can't say that the financial industry has done a tremendous job here over the past 10 or 15 years. But very often when it comes to security and national politics, it's very, very difficult to put a number, a risk number or probability on, on a particular risk. And historically, if you don't know if you roughly know what an outcome might be, but you have no idea what the likelihood is, you are faced with uncertainty. So this is in a sense what you really want to, want to um, break down. Now, if you just, just, I'm not gonna go into this, just to give you a sense of how would you want to identify risk? Well, you start off by saying, what are my core interests? What are the assets that I want to protect? You speculate or look at historical data or look at the current political situation, ask yourself, what are the threats to these interests, to these assets? And then, of course, it's not just a threat, but it's like, how significant is this threat? How much of our vulnerability uh, do you face in this scenario? What are the costs if the risk materializes? And then based on this, well, once you've gone through these steps, you have identified the risks, at least conceptually. You've analyzed and to some extent evaluated the impacts in terms of costs. And this then sets the stage for what's called risk treatment, where you get an opportunity to potentially lay off some of those risks or mitigate some of those risks. Or you might decide that it's not worth mitigating those risks at all. But this is sort of the cycle, the steps you go through. And as you can see, we started off with uncertainty. We have no idea what the, what, what the world is going to look like, or very little idea what the world is going to look like, say, five years from now. But we're trying to break down uncertainty and risk to make it more manageable, as it were. Then what you would do probably is uh, you would want to rank those risks uh, with all, again, with, with all the limitations in terms of do we know what probability is? Do we really know what the impact is? But this is a risk manager approach. Again, it's breaking it down analytically. So in this particular case, I'm making this up, of course, and that's subject to discussion. But the, the probability of Afghanistan turning into some sort of terrorism base is perhaps higher than the, um, it, so it's, it, it's lower than the risk of expanding Chinese influence. This is very subjective. So we don't have historical data to make the judgment call, but what you do is you bring experts, put them around the table and they come to some sort of conclusion. But what this does really is it informs your, your view of potential, potential futures and the potential risks that you're facing. And now you know what risks you might want to manage first. So if you're more worried about, so ideally what you would worry about, what you would worry about most is high probability, high impact. Um, but you can rank risks, and that might allow you then to decide which risk do you want to prioritize in terms of management and which risks are perhaps less important. So you're quite, quite okay with particular risk materializing because the costs of those risks, the impact of those risks, once they materialize, is not that significant for you. So this is a pretty neat way, again, of, of breaking down the problem. What we'll be discussing in the course is also like how much uncertainty or ignorance attaches to our estimates of those risks. I think this is very, very key. I've worked in risk management organizations and everyone walking around for the most part pretends they know what the risk is. In reality, we don't know. So a certain degree of, of, of epistemic humility is very important when you, when you measure risk and particularly if you, if you manage risk. Um, and also as, as Chris and Michael mentioned early on, oftentimes, particularly international politics, our predictions are very likely to be wrong or somewhat off or massively off. So sometimes it's not so much a question of, of focusing on one particular risk. It's more like anticipating a range of outcomes. And I will be talking about scenarios that allow you to prepare for those as well. But this is a very interesting approach. So what you're doing is you're not saying, you're not saying I'm managing this particular risk. You're putting yourself in a position where you are potentially able to then absorb whatever risk might materialize. If you have a more specific view of risk, what you can do is uh, 
you have, you have, you have four strategies. You can avoid the risk altogether if you can. In the Afghanistan case, it'd be very difficult. How can you avoid the fact there's instability? You can try to mitigate, for example, terrorism risk by perhaps striking deals with the Taliban or getting involved in local politics. Transferring the risk will also be very, very difficult. Um, of course, that's something we can discuss how you, might, how you might want to do this. In the financial markets, that's much easier. You can just buy a hedge or you can sell off the risk. If you're faced with a political situation like Afghanistan in the longer term, it's not a risk you can really avoid globally because Afghanistan will be there. And whatever happens in Afghanistan will have an impact on your, on your interests. And ultimately, you can just accept the risk and not worry about whether you want to treat it or not. Of course, if you do this, then you want to make sure that if the risk materializes, that you are resilient and robust enough to sustain whatever comes your way. And then just very briefly on um, breaking down, identifying risks and dealing with uncertainty from a, a broader monitoring perspective, and that's a longer term process, I think, as it is bound to be in the case of Afghanistan. And it's been around, it will be around. It probably will be some source of instability for the region, perhaps in terms of uh, asymmetric threats and so, and so on and so forth. But what you would need to do is review your assumptions occasionally, review your, the probabilities you attach, review your assessment of risk. Because number one, there might be new risks emerging. So you really wanna make sure that you are ahead of the curve if at all possible. Secondly, the, the, the likelihood of risk materializing might change because the local circumstances might change. Let's say the Taliban take over, like they, they don't take over Afghanistan, but they're able to control international terrorism as a risk. Then you know, that, that risk sort of moves down your, 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 your ranking, your list of priorities. Uh, then you also should reassess the original risk, not just the, the actual risk, but the probabilities you, you attach to them. Let's say, for example, nothing happens politically, but say potential terrorists acquire new capabilities that are much more a threat now than they were 20 years ago, then you really have to adjust your risk management framework or rather the parameters that you use managing risk. Um, and then also the risk treatment options might change because the cost of treating particular risks by avoiding them or mitigate them, they might change as well due to political circumstances. So that's, that's another way of just trying to stay ahead of the curve or staying, staying on the curve <laughs> as it were, to be able to break down and analyze risk. And of course, last but not least, I mentioned this, it's very important to be uh, open-minded and ask yourself, what is it you don't know? And how confident are you in your risk estimates? Because ultimately this informs your risk-based approach and how good you are at managing risk at the end of the day. Okay, I think I'll stop here and hand it over to Aish. Great, thank you so much, Marcus. And now we'll turn it over to Ashwara Gupta, who teaches the scenarios planning course within the certificate program. Hi, everyone. I am going to share my screen with you and walk you through scenarios and really picking up where, where Marcus left off and giving us you know, a good overview of how to manage risk. Um, Building off of identification of risk, going into Afghanistan, you inherently understand that the risk there is high. And scenarios here are used more as a policy tool to apply alternative approaches to understand disruptive changes and challenge traditional mindsets in the policy arena. So here you would, again, assess the impact, the plausibility of the known unknowns, um, as I would refer to them, because by definition, unknown unknowns seem to be our black swan events that we really don't know are likely to happen. Uh, some would you know, say that you can, to a certain degree, forecast some of those. But I think by, by definition, those unknown unknowns and black swan events um, are unseen. So, so identifying them is traditionally harder. So we, we do try to focus our energies more on known unknowns and, and potentially throw in some wild card events. Um, and then you test current policies against what the future implications are to assess the risk of a certain situation. And it allows you through this to make more well-informed decisions about long-term and strategic options. So 
Um, working off of what Marcus presented, you use this to build off your, your mitigation, your risk mitigation strategies. And to do this, I'll walk you through the approach that's traditionally used or that we do in, use in the course um, to, to sort of parse out um, scenarios and, and how we would approach in this, in this case, Afghanistan. So after you initially identify a topic, you also need to you know, focus more narrowly on, on exactly what within that topic or that thematic area in a situation like Afghanistan, where are you focusing on the political aspect of it? Are you focusing on the humanitarian or, or social aspect? And, and once you parse down and distill the topic to what you want to focus on, that's where you develop drivers. Uh, drivers are really the forces that guide your scenario and, and their interaction is key to exploring different outcomes. So some of the risks that, that Marcus talked about, whether it's terrorism, regional actor intervention, um, these, are, these are definitely drivers uh, in, in a scenario exercise that would give you some outcomes of the future. And, and you use those drivers along with some uncertainty to, to see how a scenario would progress. So in the case of Afghanistan, what, what we do know is that there could be regional actor intervention, there could be increased or decreased Chinese involvement, but um, we'll, we'll use that as an uncertainty in this case. And we'll also use the Taliban and, and their you know, lack thereof or their, their impetus to evolve beyond their, their previous policies and, and stances. And then once you map your, map your uncertainties um, and, and then you develop your scenario options, once you do that, you would then workshop these. And, and workshopping is, I, I would argue, one of the more important parts of the, of the scenario exercise because it allows you to cultivate diverse views on a situation. You may look at things uniquely. You, you get subject matter experts, some, some folks who have actually you know, studied the topic, have looked at different factors, and bring diverse views to the table to all provide some guidance on where the, uti where the utility of these scenarios, where they would be more, most impactful. And once you, you workshop these ideas, then, then you go into the actual scenario development uh, process and identify either the chronological scope, whether you're, do, you're planning for five years, 10 years, develop na narratives, and, and ultimately drawing some policy implications from all of this. Now, impact and probability is something uh, Marcus talked about as well. And if you look at Afghanistan, for one, um, you know, the staging ground for terrorism is, is something that's, that's inevitable. And we've seen that ISIS-K, for example, has increased their, the number of attacks they've had. The, the dynamic between the Taliban and ISIS is, is an important one to identify when assessing the risk here, because Taliban has, has historically had close ties with Al-Qaeda, um, so much so that you know, members of the Haqqani network are part of the newly formed Taliban government. But ISIS-K uh, has been opposed to the Taliban regime because of their nationalistic ambitions, whereas ISIS's ambitions are more driven and, and close to the caliphate. And that, that's from a current point in time view, but it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be lost on, on a Jake Sullivan or any you know, policy maker to actually identify the risk that, that, would, be, that would exist when, when the US is withdrawing from Afghanistan because there, there is a possibility and that's what we saw happen is that the, the terrorist activity has increased. October 15th, there was a bombing by ISIS-K in Kandahar um, August 26, I think that was one that, that remains um, widely known when the U.S. was still uh, withdrawing and there, there was a, um, 
the Kabul airport bombing. And it inherent, inherently, you know, the, these are just, these are core factors that would drive any scenario. And similarly, one of the, the more high impact and high probability um, drivers here is, is the economy in Afghanistan. Even before the U.S. withdrew, we, we knew that COVID had, um, had hurt the economy in Afghanistan. We knew that the infrastructure was already lacking. And now, given uh, the Taliban's um, recent takeover, we've also seen that you know, there, there's a lack of uh, foreign currencies in Afghanistan. Um, the, the Economist had, uh, had a study where they predicted, I think by 2022, um, you're expecting to see 97% of, of Afghanis living in poverty. Um, so these are important factors to consider as drivers, especially with a, a youth bulge that's growing in Afghanistan. Um, similarly, there's, you know, the Taliban's history of extrajudicial killings. Um, th those have, have not particularly ceased since the newly formed government. The Taliban govern governance is still lacking, right? There, there's still challenges to transitioning from fighting a guerrilla warfare to, to managing a government, managing a whole state and providing the, the services that one expects of a government. But in, in parallel, the Taliban is also facing a challenge to its legitimacy because by not being identified uh, and recognized by um, other state actors. Similarly, the regional actors, which Marcus talked about, you know, you have China who, who has some interest in, in seeing um, Afghanistan not, not fall back into um, old patterns to avoid U.S. involvement. And there are other actors that have historical presence in Afghanistan, such as Russia. And, you know, those are important, important actors to consider outside of, you know, Pakistan, India, the, the more traditional South Asian ones, you also have two countries um, that have a vested interest there. And on, on the other side, you also have Iran, um, where you see, again, the push and pull uh, of regional power. So, um, I mean, going into, and again, these are just, you know, some of the drivers, there could be many more. And when you're, when you're talking about Afghanistan, these can't be viewed in a vacuum, right? And as you, as you move through the process of developing scenarios and, and take into account the various, um, the various trends that exist already um, and what should have been considered, these are just some of, of the various factors that the U.S. government should be looking at and, and has probably already looked at while considering uh, what the possibility is and what the future of Afghanistan looks like. Um, I sort of spoke to all of these, uh, but again, um, some of the ones that, that we didn't touch on like resistance and ethnic fault lines. There, there has been resistance in, in remote regions, uh, uprisings in the Pensia Valley. Um, there's already, you know, uh, a divide within the Taliban itself um, because they're, it's comprised mostly of the Pashtuns, but there's minorities, including the Tajiks, the Hazaras, which you see becoming more pronounced, especially with, um, with the number, with the numbers really increasing as you, as you go into the more, more, more remote regions of Afghanistan. So um, if you start to, you know, see all these drive, drivers interact and you map these scenarios, what, what you do come up with is when, when you look at international cooperation and the political reform that the Taliban uh, would potentially, I guess, reform or not reform, um, you come up with, you know, four uh, scenarios, or at least th these are the ones that, you know, based on my research that uh, I, would, I would put forward. Um, there, there could be a, a Taliban stalemate, there could be a very fragmented Afghanistan, and um, there could be a very turbulent internal uh, war if you have, with some in international cooperation, but without political reform, you, you do see that the Taliban would be 
would have a lot more um, a lot more descent into chaos, so to speak, if uh, if there have if there are more ethnic and um, uprising smaller uprisings in the outskirts of uh, the major cities, right? And and the the worst case scenario here with no international cooperation and no political reform, you could see um, Afghanistan descending into a uh, complete civil war similar to, to Syria. And that's that's where um, really, you know, you, you want to see how these drivers interact. And we can go a little bit into uh, what these scenarios look like, but I just want to see where we are on time, Michelle, before I get, before I get carried away and uh, dive a little bit more deeply into this. That's great, Ash. Um, yeah, I would say probably another five minutes um, can be yours if that's okay. Helpful. Okay. Um, all right. And so if we look at these from, and, and again, you know, take this as, you know, from a point in time of today moving into the future, and we'll, we'll come up with some key character characteristics of these scenarios. If the Taliban, you know, increases their political reform, you would see them um, invest a lot more in state building and easing their stance on some of some of the more controversial things that the Taliban has been chastised for in the past, like women's rights, right? That's something uh, we've seen at the front and center. But what, what does that, what would that lead to? That would um, still lead to some dissent amongst uh, the Taliban's ranks, right? So you would see there, a little bit uh, more of a fragmentation internally within the Taliban. Um, and this scenario wouldn't take into account, uh, you know, a, a more uh, prominent role of, of ISIS or Al-Qaeda, but you would still have a lack of recognition by the international community. Um, and the lack of aid would still, would still hurt Afghanistan. Um, but as you move, in, move through these scenarios, you'd also see even if um, there was aid and there was trade in Afghanistan, um, you, you would still see increased increased engagement with international actors, but the, the economy would, would not be able to recover still because there's a lack of, lack of infrastructure in the distribution of the funds. And this primarily would be driven by, by the Taliban's uh, capabilities, right? There, there have been a lot of ministry positions that remain unfilled at, at the actual uh, local level. And, and just having the, the higher level power positions filled uh, does not mean you have enough uh, capacity at the local level to actually enact any policies. And, and really, these scenarios try to parse out some of those more intrinsic factors that, that the Taliban is facing currently. And you also see that you know China can become a major player, and so can Iran. As, as you as you move in move through these scenarios because if you if you look at um, the other side of the border right um, Iran does have some interest especially given um, the ethnic fault lines within Afghanistan um, the the Sunnisia divide um, and and a civil war scenario you would see ISIS taking a stronger role you would have international actors uh, looking to either counter or support the Taliban because there is no infrastructure in terms of intelligence gathering. And they would, there would be ultimate in international actor intervention if there was um, a civil war with, within Afghanistan. And even if it didn't devolve into a complete civil war scenario, you would, still have um, an ISIS that would, you know, make a lot of headway in recruitment. You have 60% of the Afghani population under the age of 35. It, it leaves um, it as a breeding ground for, uh, for terrorism because you still have a very, uh, very turbulent economy and with not many places to look. And if there isn't much reform on the part of the Taliban. You can see how 
how the situation could evolve into one where there would be, um, there would still be soft oppositions and, and uh, at times harder opposition to the, to the Taliban. So these are just some of the some of the scenarios that could come out of it. There could be very many, and I'm sure there are so many other factors that we could consider as we build out these scenarios. But if you look at it from this perspective, um, you start to see that there are some policy implications that you know the international community responses not just the U.S. needs a long-term strategic focus, not just reactive to providing aid, because it, it doesn't take into account the, the various nuances that exist within Afghanistan. And then you, you start to rethink um, the, the governments have to start engaging in some way, shape, or form with the Taliban to prevent a complete descent into civil war. And, and Ultimately, the, the rapid pace of ISIS-K and the reactive responses um, can have some consequences on the, on the state building as well. So over time, um, these dangers can, uh, can of you know, downplaying underlying trends can have some unintended consequ consequences such as civil war or um, you know, a more protracted conflict in the region. And I guess I'm going to stop there because I think I'm at time. And Michelle, I do want to turn it over to some of our some of our attendees if they have any questions. Great, thank you so much, Marcus and Ash. Um, and Marcus, if you'd like to rejoin us on the virtual stage. Great, so um, attendees, please do feel free to go ahead and submit your questions via the Q&A tool. Um, but if I can take the liberty of asking a first question. Um, so there's this clear benefit, right, that we can see for this type of training for policymakers. But who else or what other types of jobs do you think would benefit um, from this type of, of training in general? And either one of you can can take that. Well, I, I can I can start and hopefully Marcus can can add on his thoughts. Um, I think it's not just policymakers. It's um, it's also for anyone who is involved from NGOs to any actors um, locally or uh, at the grassroots level as well. But uh, more importantly, the scenario planning is not just something we use in, in the international relations space. You, you, see, you see shell scenarios that's very focused on the business aspect of it. Scenario planning is also used in, in various, various financial services um, as, as a stress test, as um, you know, a, a, a tool to, to foresee any, any sort of unintended consequences of, of current you know, risk factors that, that are being considered or risk mitigation policies that, that institutions may have in place. But sometimes, you know, they need to see how some, some critical events interact with one another and what sort of futures or what sort of uh, ultimate outcomes you can get from that and, and sort of work backwards from, from these futures and make sure they don't actually come true. <laughs> Fantastic, Marcus. I would just add to this that I think, I mean, I, I don't want to overstate here the attractiveness of this course, but it is really for everyone, like any organization that is involved in any kind of forward-looking risk taking, and in fact, any kind of policy decision-making should have an interest in having people on their team to think about the future in this more structured way. And even further than that, I think any individual should do this because your individual life decisions, you can, I know we don't like to think of those in those terms, but you can break them down. Risk, ambiguity, what do we know? What does it we don't know? What do we do when things post case go wrong? Do we have a backup plan? So I think for any, any thinking individual, it's, it's, it's great. I think for any individual that takes decision, um, but of course, globally it's more important for large organizations that have to take very substantial decisions in very complex environments. That's great. And, and for those of you who are attending, 
if you decide to, to pursue this program, these are the two uh, foundational anchor courses for the program. And then the third piece is an applied project course. So identifying um, a problem and running it through one of these scenarios. So, so students in this will have a portfolio piece. Um, they can use a real world scenario that they're confronting within their job or select um, a scenario that, that is just related or is of interest to them. So a question from the audience is, when we're considering some of these variables, identifying some of the variables um, that you spoke about, should practitioners be aware of cultural bias or political or economic orientations of thought as they're thinking through some of these frameworks? Ashley, you want to go first? Sure. Um, you know, it, it, it's a great question because I think that's that's one of the things that, that we try to emphasize the most, right? And that, that's one of the utilities of a workshop. Um, and I think in scenario planning and any kind of risk management, you want to get a diverse set of views because the whole point is to actually take into account things that you may not actually know from, from where you sit, right? We, we are all sitting in the comforts of our homes, um, analyzing the situation in Afghanistan. But here, when we're actually discussing this, you would want some, some real world, you know, practitioners, you want some people on the ground there who can order unique perspectives and, and call any kind of bias, be it cultural, be it political, uh, all of these factors need to be taken into consideration because you can't come up with a plausible or um, a high probability scenario if you're blind to uh, some of some of the intrinsic, like uh, inherent biases that people uh, may have, whether it is towards a state, to a government, or even to a people. Yeah, I would just add to this that I think it's usually important. I mentioned that you want to have a diverse group of people that sits around the table and talks to each other. Cognitively, for sure, that should be very diverse. And at least in my part of the course, it's, uh, it takes up a fair amount of uh, space when we're looking at statistical biases, when we have more accurate, we think we have more accurate data, but also to perceptual and cultural biases anything that leads you on average to like not hit the mark. And we know fairly well based on research where, where these uh, biases, even where they come from, but we also have a rough idea how we can mitigate them. And of course, at the organizational level, you can structure the bureaucracy in a way that you can address those issues. But I think at the individual level, we have to learn how to live with those biases. And the funny thing to me always is like, we, we all say, yeah, we have biases, like, but everyone else has them, I don't have them. That seems incongruent, but that's exactly the kind of thing we'll be talking about as well. And we're going through some case studies where these biases did seem to lead to bad decisions. That's great. And I think that that sort of dovetails nicely into the next question is, you know, I imagine that that some of these frameworks um, are not new, but you can correct me if that assumption is incorrect. So why aren't these methodologies and frameworks being implemented more across the board, whether it's in international NGOs, in government, in the financial sector? Um, are they, or, you know, it, it seems to be, especially in the case of Afghanistan, that maybe um, there were different approaches that were used in lieu of some of this thinking that, that you mentioned. Uh, so I would just say that I, I do think large organizations very often do have risk management. They might have they risk management uh, agencies and groups. Financial institutions, they, they have to have it, which brings its own sort of problem, but even, even finance ministries and defense departments and all kinds of institutions, I think they, they, they do have them. To my mind, the challenge is often, how do you run a bureaucracy in a way that it becomes an effective risk management organization? So it's not just knowing what you, how to do it, you also have to staff your organizations in a way that you bring about those outcomes. Uh, so I, I do think the large organizations, for sure, they for, for the most part, they do have them if you look at Oil companies, they have this, they have, financial industry has it. Many government institutions do have it. For the smaller institutions, probably not so much because it's expensive to run, you need expertise and it needs years to build a solid risk culture. 
Yeah, and I think I'd add on to that, you know, scenarios for one have been around for a long time as a policy tool. You have RAND, uh, National Security Council, Shell, um, and, you know, their whole methodology is based around uh, what Shell does vis-a-vis -vis what, what the National Security Council does. I think in the grander scheme of things, it, it's not just, um, it's not just applying it. Uh, it's also finding the right case to apply it, right? Because the, these um, an exercise like scenario planning takes takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of, as Marcus mentioned, dedicated resources uh, with time to to really specialize in, in that and, and organize around it. Because it, it could take, you know, you, Michelle, you, you've seen this uh, in in our several scenario planning exercises. It could be it could be months. It could be a whole year. It could be two years that that it takes to to actually get the right people around the table. To start discussing these topics um, and, and actually presenting different points of view. So I think the challenge um, remains that you know it's it's the right combination of, of situations plus resources plus impetus, right? Uh, when when you want to to use these uh, frameworks. That's great. So you know, Ash, you touched on this a little bit. So. You know, we've heard about risk management scenarios, um, I think people have heard about, but how does this differ from forecasting or how is this the same as forecasting? So it, it's, uh, I actually uh, almost thought about that when we came up with, uh, when, when the question about the cultural bias uh, was asked. So forecasting um, is, is very unique because it actually asks you to put, to put to test like some of what you're predicting, right? And scenario planning is again, a planning tool. You're not predicting anything. You're not testing the accuracy of your scenarios. In, in a forecast, you're given very specific situations. The ultimate methodologies might be similar, but the outcome is very different, right? And with forecasting, I think, you know, you, you get into a more nuanced detail. And, and I think Marcus, you know, you touched upon this about actually exploring bias because to be a, an, uh, a forecaster you actually have to to weed out your your biases I think uh, one of the 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 greatest books that I've read on that is thinking fast thinking so I think with by uh, Danny Kahneman and we they explore in greater detail the effect of uh, biases on, on actually and super forecasting as well um, you know they they all explore uh, these these ideas of uh, forecasting and, and preciseness and accuracy, um, which is something you know you might not see in scenario planning, uh, but of course it helps uh, if you're more if you can be more precise and accurate. But again, it's it's an art, not a science, and forecasting veers more into the science of it. Is is what I would argue. Great, Marcus. Anything. No, I think it's exactly right. I, I, I spent 20 years working on Wall Street and everyone makes a forecast, but very few people then look back and say, well, how good of a track record do we actually have? And the answer is, of course, forecasts are almost invariably wrong. The question is, how wrong are they relative to what you were forecasting? And more importantly, you're assuming a relatively, typically a fairly stable scenario going forward. And what we've seen certainly in finance over the past 20 years, on and off, we've had massive tail events. And these are, these are by nature very hard to, to calculate or attach a risk number to it. So in that sense, that's where the anticipation part or the scenario planning part comes in and says, well, if these things materialize, how well are we positioned to absorb the shock? How robust are we as an organization? So your individual forecast is kind of almost neither here nor there. You wanna, you wanna prepare for a range of scenarios because the future is, complex and is variable, and that's what we need to plan for. So your point forecast is nice if you can get it right, which is very rare, but it's typically not very useful, particularly if you get it wrong more often than you get it right. That's great. Yeah, you can make weather forecasts, for, for example, how, how often are they right? <laughs> That's true. Maybe maybe in some regions where it's uh, it's a little bit more consistent, they they have a better um, rate of success for sure. Um, so I know, probably. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Foggy and a little dreary. 
Um, so I know we are running short on time. So I want to give both of you an opportunity to add any last thoughts or, or points. Um, and so I will go ahead and go Marcus first this time to switch up the order. And then I'll let Ash have the last word. Yeah, so I would say if, uh, if you do take this course, you will learn hands-on like risk management practices. But to my mind, what's more important, it, it introduces you to thinking about how to think about risk and how to think about uncertainty, which again, in my experience, I've seen a lot of people in risk management organizations, they were taught certain ways of doing things, they kept doing those things, but because they weren't that aware of what it is they were actually doing beyond the, 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 the tactical stuff, uh, they, they should have thought about what does it mean? What is risk? What is uncertainty? And we'll be discussing those issues. So how, how confident can we be in our judgments? And how should we approach those issues? And then as a consequence, if you ever are in a position where you are the one who's not just managing the nitty gritty risk down the, the production line, but you're the one who sets risk appetite and puts in place risk management systems, you need to think much more philosophically, intellectually about those problems. So this will be also an important part of the course in addition to the practical takeaway. Great, thanks. Yeah, and, and to add to what Marcus said, um, you know, the, the utility of, of scenarios are, are much broader, broader than just policy tools or, um, or just, you know, anticipating change. It's, it's also more about, uh, you know, learning a skill set, enhancing research skills, thinking about topics more diversely, and you can apply those, uh, those skills in almost, you know, every field, every business, um, and every opportunity you come up with. So it's it's not just a, a regular methodology that that we teach in these courses. We also teach some fundamental, you know, skill sets that that people can take away and learn from. Amazing. Well, a huge thanks to the both of you and professors Oppenheimer and Inkerson, um, and thanks to the attendees who, who joined us today. We will send a follow-up message uh, with a link to today's video and information about the certificate program. Uh, we do hope that everyone will sign up, of course, um, but if there are any questions, please do feel free to reach out. And again, a huge thank you to Ash and Marcus. Um, thanks again, and we will see you later. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone.